The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. I'd like to invite all of you, just, you know, if it helps you close your eyes or whatever, just take a moment. I want you to think of, in your life, maybe it was this past week, or some moment in your life where you experienced a great joy. Now that you have, hopefully in your mind's eye, that joy that you experienced, think of how much you wanted to share that joy with others and in what way you may have done that. Okay, very good. Hopefully you have in your mind's eye a a joy, a, a great joy in how that joy came into your heart and you just couldn't hold back that you wanted to share it. For you little ones, maybe it was like the, the kindergartner that came out after the 7.30 a.m. mass with uh, her great joy, okay? And her great joy was Winnie the Pooh, okay? So she was hugging Winnie the Pooh, Pooh like no get out and brought not little Winnie the Pooh, but big Winnie the Pooh to mass with her, right? So she had Winnie the Pooh, and I said, can I hug Winnie the Pooh? I like Winnie the Pooh too, and so she gave me Winnie the Pooh, but I could see in her heart, radiating her face, it was a great joy. Stuffed animal. Stuffed animal, but something to hug, something to, something to love in that way, and that desire to share it. She wanted to show Winnie the Pooh to me. It's important to her. I think of a joy that I wanted to share was to receive the text message from my sister about my niece, the first of all my nieces and nephews, and she's gonna have a child. She got news she's gonna have a child. And so what's my sister doing? Rather, send a text, whatever, tried to call me first, couldn't get me with a call, there's a missed call, sends a text. Trying to tell everybody the joy, to share the joy of that. Joy is something so good to share. I think it's a time, you know, and we have to be kind of kind of real at times about uh, the life and the struggle of life in the world. But if there can be good news, there can be good news out there that brings great joy, well then also too at times there can be bad news. There can be bad news that can hit our heart. When we think of the life of St. Paul, right? St. Paul says, for me, life is Christ, death is gain. There is no bad news for St. Paul. It was all good news. The good news he was trying to tell the Thessalonians. But the reality is life, we can walk through life and we can at times be like Peter that steps out from the boat, steps out from the boat, starts walking on water, but the waves, the circumstances in our life that we cannot control, the things beyond our capability of control start rocking. Then the voices behind us, other people in the boat say, what are you doing? What you're doing is pretty crazy. And we may not have the sight of Jesus because the mist and the fog and whatever, but Peter could hear his voice and he walked to that voice. He saw him at first, but then he continued to walk. He walked to the voice. The voice drew him and gave him the strength. Like that Psalm, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, my strength. Gave him the capability to do something that was crazy. Walking on water. Someone sent me a little image in a text not too long ago, and the text was, it was like this kind of dark mountain thing with the water, and they said, and it basically said, if you feel like in life you're drowning, remember, remember, your savior is your lifeguard. Your savior is your lifeguard, you have a lifeguard. 
good news, the good news of Jesus Christ, we look to Jesus. But if, if we're real and we look at it, if we're not careful, there's the good news, but then also there's the nightly news, there's the daily news, there's all the news, no matter where it's coming from, that may be coming from us. And you may be like, well, Father, while well, I'm turning off the news, I'm not watching the news, and I'm not plugging into it on my internet and all that other stuff, but then you go to work or you go out in the community and all of a sudden people talk and everything seems like there's like this anxiety or this anxiousness going on and what do you, what do you kind of do with it? How do we handle that? How do we handle that as St. Paul was trying to encourage those first Christians and Christians of all times who've been able to handle it and handle it well with the help of God's grace is with a Christian worldview. Christians in moments of difficulty and struggle, they united, they came together like we do on this Sunday, we come together. They come together in that moment of adversity, that moment of, of difficulty. I mentioned uh, Father Oscar here. It wasn't easy for him to be serving as a priest and one day be, be put, in, put in jail, along with his bishop who's still in jail and other people and the uncertainty of that. The uncertainty of that, but nobody, nobody, no circumstance, no other person, nobody can, can, can rob us of the joy that Jesus gives. But if we're not careful, we can give it away. We can just give it away, we can surrender it. We can surrender that joy. That's what brings us here today to have an encounter, a real authentic encounter with joy, Christian worldview, and then to share that joy with the world. It's not just a song during Christmas, joy to the world. Joy to the world, Jesus is like joy to the world. Bring my joy to the world and may we bring that joy to the world. Someone told me a story once of a, of a, a young priest that was newly ordained and he got ordained he was all excited, studied all the theology, had all the stuff, had everything down and knew what he was gonna do and was so excited about going out and conquering the world for Christ. So he goes out in his first assignment, he's there and he's like, Holy Spirit, you and I, we're gonna change the world. We're gonna change the world. So all that zeal, all that, making it happen, just burning the candle at both ends of wicks. We're gonna change the world. A few years go by and he's like, all right, Holy Spirit, we're trying. He's on his knees in the chapel praying. He's like, all right, okay, all right. Well, maybe not the world, right? But let's change this country, right? So they're at it. He's like praying and we're gonna do this and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna try to do this on a, on a country level and I'm gonna try to do all this stuff and I got it and we can do it and you know, da, 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 da. Then a few more years go by and he goes, all right, all right, all right. Let's say, uh, Holy Spirit, you and I, the city. Let's get this city. Right? You and I, we're going to do it. I'm going to get involved in the city and we're going to do this and we're going to change people. I'm going to make it and we're going to. And he goes through all that and he, a few more years go by and he goes, All right, maybe not the city. Okay, all right, the parish, the parish where you sign me. We're going to do it. All right, you and me, Holy Spirit, we're going to do it. We're going to change the parish right there. And then the later age of wisdom, it comes to him in prayer, says to the Holy Spirit, All right, Holy Spirit, all right, I'm a little worn out. I'm a little tired here. Holy Spirit, we've been trying, but how about let's do this? Let's just work, Holy Spirit, you and me on changing my heart. Holy Spirit, you and me, let's change my heart. And then by changing my heart and making my heart a little more like Jesus, then, then Holy Spirit, we can change the parish. Then Holy Spirit, you can do the work and you can change the city. Then Holy Spirit, you can work and then you can change this country. Then Holy Spirit, you can do that and you can bring this joy to the world. It starts in the heart. For you, me, and everybody, it's the heart. Peace begins in the heart, the fertile soil of the heart. I was out walking yesterday in one of the neighborhoods and I'm walking along and sometimes I find it helpful to, in different moments, just to read the word of God, disconnect from everything else, and then try to walk in a certain degree of silence with God's creation or whatever. So I started to walk a little more at times when I try to do it. So I'm walking in the neighborhood and I'm walking and I'm like, come on, Holy Spirit, speak to my heart. Went 45 minutes into the, in the walk, not a whole lot of speaking, you know. I mean, come on. And I was thinking about the gospel today and I was praying to our Lord about you, me, and all of us in, in this world of his and just thinking about all the stuff going on and we're walking 45 minutes into the walk. I see a dad out there on the corner in one of the neighborhoods. So you know where you got the sidewalks that meets another turn in the neighborhood? It's a little corner on it. It's just a little like insignificant, not much of a meaning corner and their yard looked really good, really green. Yeah, a nice yard. Everybody's doing the aeration and all that and planting all that stuff to grow it up, Right. And so he's out there with one of those hard rakes that they use on a baseball field, you know, to do it. So he's out there, and he has his son at his side, right? And he's there raking, or raking. And I saw him at a distance. I'm walking up, and I'm kind of reflecting. And you know when you're walking up, and, and you're walking in your neighborhood, and you see people, you see someone you know, or you may not even know, because it's not your neighborhood. Like, that wasn't my neighborhood. But then the Holy Spirit puts in your heart, you know what? 
I should offer them a smile. I should say a kind word, right? And just go by and just the, the, the joy of a smile, the joy of a kind word to somebody else. You know, when you're walking by the yard and, you know, you may not do the bordering and the mulch the same color in the same way they would. And you're kind of like, I don't like that, that, you know. But you see how hard they're working. You see what they're doing. So you go by them and say, man, the yard looks great. Looks great. And you see that it lifts them up like, well, thank you. Why your hard at work? So I'm walking along and I see this dad working with his son. Holy Spirit put on my heart to say, hey, man, looks like y'all are doing everything right. I think you're going to get some grass. I think you get some grass. And the dad kind of looks up with his son with a smile and he goes, well, we hope so. We're starting a little late. It's never too late for Jesus. Jesus at one moment in time, being outside of time, I don't know how the conversation went, but his father who's real, who he sits to the right of, at one moment in time before Mary said yes, there was a conversation between the Father and the Son. There was the Holy Spirit and the love between them. And they looked down at this earth that they created so good, as Genesis tells us. And they saw things in a way starting to go wrong, away from the good news in the direction of the bad news. And they were trying to till soil. They were trying to do things. They were trying to get the right things to grow, virtue to grow, goodness to grow, love to grow, their joy, to bring their joy, the joy that Adam and Eve had in the beginning. They even wanted to pursue Adam and Eve when they hid and said, why are you hiding? And the father of lies had deceived them to where they, were, they said they were afraid. They were afraid of God who was going to bring the only joy to their heart. And so that image of that father and the son to me was kind of like, okay, may not be theologically correct, but as I walked on, I thought about God the father with the son and said, those seeds aren't growing. They're not growing. Daddy, let me go be a seed. Let me go be one of those. Let me go down to that ground and be there and show them how to die so that in dying, it can bear fruit. Many come into this life, rightfully so, we come to live. Jesus came to die. Jesus came to die so as to, to, to show us and point us to a life that's never ending, to a joy that's never ending. He came to prove it on the cross. My brothers and sisters of Christ, it all begins with you, me, and all humanity in the heart. And we see that in the gospel today. Jesus speaking. The thing that's interesting about the gospel today, different from the one last week and the week before, Jesus doesn't say that they were malicious in their questioning. Sure, it said they tested him, but it was common to test. But they weren't trying to be deceiving or whatever. There was actually a Pharisee standing there and say, which is the greatest of all the commandments? We know in the Ten Commandments that the first three are oriented towards God. The final seven are oriented towards our neighbor. But there are a lot of other commandments. Jesus points them back to their heart. And he, and he gives a command, not an invitation. Hey, it'd be good if you do this. It'd be nice if you do this. He says, no, you shall do this. You shall. This is the commandment. You shall. You shall love the Lord God with your whole heart, with your whole soul, and with your whole mind. All that you are, give it to God. And if your heart's more like God, you're united with God, you will love your neighbor as yourself. You'll see yourself as God sees you. The great commandment is a commandment for all people. Where there's not joy in the world, it's because the world has turned things upside down. You be you. It's all about you. It's all about seeking what you want. There's a lot of unhappy people lacking joy in our world because everything's into possessing things. And ultimately what happens is things or the things of this world begin to possess us. Do I possess my possessions? Or do my possessions possess me? Is my schedule in my daily life a slave to me? Or am I a slave to my schedule? Is my relationship with Jesus and God something that comes first? Or something that fits in towards the end? 
I maybe shared this story with y'all once of a bookshelf. We can look at life as a bookshelf, all that we have on our bookshelf. And we could say, Father, the biggest book on my bookshelf, which is awesome, thank you, that's awesome, is my faith. It's the biggest book on the bookshelf. I got a bunch of other things I'm doing. By putting it as the biggest book on my bookshelf, I'm putting God's first. God is saying to you and me, I don't want your relationship with me to be the biggest book on your bookshelf. I want your relationship to be with me to be the bookshelf. I want your relationship with me to be what holds up everything you do. I want your relationship to be with me to be something that, that, that you pursue with the same joy. I want you to receive my joy and I want you to go out in the world with the same enthusiasm with the joys that you have experienced in other ways in this life. Jesus is saying to you and me, I will complete your joy. How does he say that? In John chapter 15, John 15, 11 through 12, at the Last Supper, knowing where he was going, he said, I tell you this, I tell you this, so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, love one another as I love you, as I love you. You. The answer for our times and all times is Jesus. The answer for our times and all times is to heed the commands of our God who loves us, wants our good, and wants us with him forever. And not just us, but all people. All people. That by the way we live, we may bring others into a relationship with Jesus. Maybe Maybe not in this life, but what little we do may bring them to that acceptance in the next. We don't know how it works. We don't know how it works. I know someone sent me a little post thing. I get all these little post things and I look at it through text. And it was an image, it was a picture. And it was a picture of a sign outside a church. And it said this, 0.0. .0 Two six percent, zero point zero two six percent of all children have a chance to become a professional athlete. There's nothing wrong with someone aspiring for that, working for that, and they've got a gift. They've been given that talent. Share it. Use it. I mentioned that earlier this week about the. I'm a Diamondbacks fan now because one of the pitchers was reading his Bible in between innings. Beautiful, bringing the joy to the dugout. But think about that, 0.026% of all children have a chance to become a professional athlete. The sign went on to say 100%, 100%. 100% have that chance that they will stand before Jesus at the end of time. 100%. And the sign closed with, get your children to church. So thank you parents for getting your children to church. One of the things that's gonna change this world is to get children to church, to get families to church, and to take church out to our world, to receive the joy, and then to take it back out to our world. The great commandment is simple, but it doesn't discard any of the other commandments. It, it completes them in its fullness. So I'll close with this. It goes right in line, and you've probably heard this before, but it's a real good thing to write down, J-O-Y, joy. If we truly want joy, authentic joy in our life, but Jesus first, others second, and ourselves third. Jesus, others, yourself. May we receive that joy, that level of joy, and bring that joy without fear into the world. Joy to the world.